Heart of the Universe by Jin Nua Introduction I began writing this book in 1997 on a beach in Thailand, which, coincidentally, is also where I completed it some 15 years later. The book's roots lie in simple enough origins, a newfound fascination with nature. This simplicity however, soon gave way to something much broader, more complex, and profoundly deeper. Ultimately generating thousands of journal pages and several intermediate manuscript versions along the way until finally, in February 2013, I was able to write out the book you're holding in your hands in just two days. To me. This biographical narrative isn't entirely satisfactory and leaves many questions unresolved. After all, isn't it a bit strange that such a short work took so long to develop? The questions why did it take so long? And what would possess someone to stick with it? Naturally emerge. To the first question, all I can offer by way of an answer is to say that it took an extraordinarily long time to develop because of the great distance I had to travel. It's a long way to the heart of the universe and there are no shortcuts or signposts to guide you along the way. It took 15 years to zero in on it. Yes, the distance I had to travel was the main factor. The second question is just as difficult to address. What keeps someone fixated on something so long and, at the risk of such great disappointment? The journey was in fact arduous and kept me from other things that I wanted. The discomfort I felt from the many disappointments of the project's slow progress, realizing the hard work and years spent writing and rewriting wasn't good enough, and gathering the energy to begin yet another rewrite, all proved very painful at times. So I asked myself, why did I stick with it? Was it for the excitement and fascination? Was it for the money or maybe the fame and recognition? Was it for pride in finishing what I'd started? Each factor surely played a part but, over time, what I realized is, writing a novel is a lot like marriage. We stick with it for many reasons but in the end we do it for love. So. In a flash, I discovered the reason why I wrote this book, out of love. A love of nature with her exquisite and delicate ways. A love for great ideas and their expressions in art, music, and writing. A love for the heartfelt, gentle, and caring souls of the silent majority who put aside struggles for fame and power and, instead, are kind to friends, family, and our precious planet a love of the unknown and a hope for something better yet to come. And a love and reverence for the creator who set this exquisite universe and all its goodness and rightness into motion. What, other than love, could keep the flame alive when the demands of life could have easily extinguished this grossly overdue project? A love so bright it hopefully reaches the hearts and souls of everyone who reads these pages inspiring them to reconnect with our world and take positive steps toward building better lives, closer communities, and more sensible nations on this precious planet of ours. So, please join me and Mo, S. Ray, Burskoka on a magical tour to the heart of the universe and back. Hopefully, you will experience the same great delight and solace I found on my long journey toward delivering this book to you here today. Chapter 1. Journey to the Heart of All Things Good morning, dear friend. Good morning, Jin. I thought I'd find you here. Did you sleep well? Not really. In fact, I tossed and turned all night. Was it the storm? Partly. Something else then? What's troubling you? I can't really say something's troubling me per se. In fact, most times what's on my mind is extremely satisfying. It's just that the subject matter is complicated and, at times, I become stuck, like today. That's when the frustration sets in. Please tell me more. Well, I'll try, if you've got a spare hour or so. It begins on an essential level. As anyone contemplating the very nature of being knows, and I don't mean man's world of buildings and inventions, one struck by just how bewildering existence truly is. How delightfully true. 
All of our greatest questions spring from nature and her enigmas, where did we come from? What's the meaning of life? Does a great creator orchestrate nature's marvelous symphony of being? Carry on. My journey is toward a better understanding of the universe's remarkable order and harmony. Think for a moment just how astonishing its creations are, subatomic particles, atoms, molecules, cells, insects, plants, animals, stars, planets, galaxies, and people, their orderliness and sophistication are truly miraculous. Yes, I believe most people lack an understanding of just how phenomenal existence is. That's not a bad thing, life is demanding and we all have to make a living. Contemplating the great unknown doesn't pay the bills. But if we look beyond our day-to-day -day routines, we come to realize the innumerable miracles it takes for any of this to even be here at all. Look around us. The world is brimming with order and beauty. Reality is a near impossibility when you stop to think about it. I guess the fact that it's happening in all corners of the universe is what leads us to the ponderings we're discussing. Trying to understand its mysteries is made even more challenging due to science's silence on matters of creation and being. Scientists admit their very rules prohibit what can even be considered. For instance, if an experiment isn't exactly repeatable, it can't be considered scientific. The subject falls completely off science's radar. Yes. Science tells us much in matters of measuring the world, yet, unless there's an exact relationship, science won't touch it. Of course, nature cares little for what science ignores or acknowledges, the universe created its marvels of creation long before science came about. Amen. While we should appreciate science, we should also know it will never provide all the answers. What does religion say? Religion also provides many great insights. However, like science, there are limitations. Don't get me wrong, I believe in God, it's just that religion's not geared toward uncovering the deep nuances of the physical world. You do have a lot on your mind. I'll tell you what, let's take a walk. It's the best treatment for clearing the mind and refreshing the soul. Good idea. Let's walk to the lake's point. It's a light hike and offers many breathtaking sights. Great. I also like how walking helps crystallize my thoughts, it's as though the nature of paths, the act of discovery, and the structure of a hike all share a common, underlying process. It makes sense I suppose, they are all journeys to a destination. After you. When you spoke of how miraculous being is, I was reminded of something my mother once said, God's in everything. If that's true, maybe we shouldn't overly complicate things. Maybe we should just focus on the earthly creations before us to help us uncover nature's mysteries, and begin to fathom the thinking behind it. Interesting perspective but I don't know where to start. Let's start from the beginning. Let us launch our inquiry in the time and space we share now. The world before us is the universe. Take a moment, look about you, and describe what you see. I see a lot of things, plants flowers, trees, birds, rocks, and ants. I also see a stream over there, clouds overhead, and the sun on the horizon. What else? There's an odd rightness to everything. Everything looks just right and seems to fit together, like it's meant to be where it is. Oddly enough, even for nature's seemingly wild diversity, everything also seems to share a fundamental consistency, a unifying kind of aesthetic. In fact, I can't fathom improving anything before us, in any way. That's an excellent start. Your words are profound and echo those of great artists like Blake, Whitman, Lajou, and Van Gogh when they describe the beauty streaming throughout the universe. Thanks. I feel uplifted, whenever I immerse myself in nature and experience her charms. Communicating this experience is very satisfying. Without possibly knowing it, your observation that all things share a certain commonality was quite profound. Yes, it's hard to describe the exact quality but nature's creations do share an advanced consistency of sorts, as if they were all crafted from the same blueprint. Taking it a step further, one's tempted to speculate that all of creation shares a consistent design template. A common suchness generated by a consistent universal ordering process. Yes. 
nature's copious designs strongly suggest that someone or something is creating them, apparently through a process so subtle we've been unable to capture or define it thus far. This line of reasoning forms a significant development in our discussions so I'm going to ask, is there a principle or a designer orchestrating nature's creative force? But before we attempt to answer this delightful enigma, let's dive deeper into our direct surroundings. Let's examine a specific example, this flower on the tree before us, for instance. What do you see? Is it communicating anything to us? Right off, I can say with certainty that it's beautiful. Just look at it. Its vibrant color shines brightly as does its distinct form. It possesses some quality that quickens the heart and warms the soul. As form is synonymous with order, let's stick with the quality of form for a while. Does the flower's shape provide any clues to how the flower's ordered? To me, what stands out is its coherence, which is a magical holism and profound collaborativeness capable of transforming assortments of dirt, water, air, and sunlight into an orderly pattern. It's like an emperor giving billions of people a set of instructions and then, them working efficiently and instinctively together, to create something both organized and beautiful. What you're describing is in fact the transformation of groups of parts into a larger whole. Yes. It's the same phenomenon Aristotle referred to as the whole being more than the sum of its parts, it's exactly this quality of being that the science of systems theory is seeking to better understand and define. To finish this thought, let's stick with the flower's form a bit longer. This time let's consider the qualities of its overall form. Okay. Its shape is intriguing, it seems to be a spiral or radial arrangement. Its overall symmetric shape appears to be a key element towards contributing to its cohesiveness and aesthetic appeal. There's clearly something transcendental about symmetry. Its quality can be found throughout the universe. Let's focus on symmetry for a moment. Does symmetry have any essential features? There must be but I'm not sure what they are. Maybe we shouldn't overthink this. Since our minds and this fine flower were both created by the same universe, perhaps we should allow them to communicate directly without interference to see what naturally arises. So take a few moments to consider the blessed form before us and heed its tale. My first impression is that it looks like a whirlpool, much like water draining down a sink. Taking that observation one step further, we might say the petals are consistently arranged about a single and common central location. That's an interesting observation. The relationship of its overall shape to the focal point at its center appears to hold a special significance, as though the center is an essential element of what symmetry is. I think you're on to a very important point. Central objects indeed reside at the heart of all of nature's big hitters. In fact, atoms, cells, central nervous systems, solar systems, galaxies, city infrastructures, and even societies feature prominent centers of which their larger, symmetrical form is anchored about. Centers appear to play a very significant role in how nature's creations are formed. But what role? Let's consider another example to see if we can gain further insights. Let's shift our focus to the tree on which our lovely flower is Ides. Since the flower arose from the tree, I suspect they probably share something in common. Okay, I'll start. I see bunches of interwoven branches but I can't say they look much like a whirlpool or that they demonstrate a 360 degree symmetry. Yes, it is difficult to see at first, so I will recall an experience that might shed some light. I was on a bridge crossing a gorge one day when I looked down on the trees below, I noticed that each tree's overall shape was a whirlpool when viewed from above. So, in fact, if you look more closely, or from the right perspective, you'll see that all the branches converge toward its main trunk. I see that now. Taking it a step further, once we consider the roots below ground, I can see the tree's larger, mirror-like symmetry. Because its roots are hidden, it's easy to forget that a tree's upper portion is wonderfully reflected by its root structure in terms of both shape and volume. It begs the question, does the tree have a center? I suppose so. At its trunk? But where along the trunk? 
I guess it would be the place where the trunk enters the ground. Good. Is there any other reason why that spot is significant? I see what you're getting at, that's the location where the tree began, where its original seedling took root. Yes. The seedling marks the center of the tree's structure. It was a tiny yet in many ways, a colossal beginning of what ultimately became this massive creation we see before us today. I note you just stated that the seedling is not only the geometric center of a tree but also the place where it began. I believe that to be another significant point. Centers are not only key to maintaining the tree's center-oriented symmetry as it grows, they're also the tree's point of origin. Can you think of other examples where centers correspond with a beginning point? Not off the top of my head. Can you help? I'd be happy to. Luckily, I've read extensively on nature and recall many examples. For instance, stars begin as a minute center of gravity within a dust cloud in space. A snowflake originates from a single seed water molecule. Entire volcanoes begin when humbly sized lava flows poke their way up through the Earth's surface. It's also in the turbulence of a butterfly's wings which can ultimately change weather patterns halfway around the world. Those are some great examples. What about our lives? Are seedlings there as well? First and foremost, we must consider each of us began from a single cell which ultimately grew into the intricately formed organism each of us are today. Another example is when new ideas take root and grow to engulf entire nations. I'm of course referring to fads, new scientific theories, and philosophical doctrines which each began from the thoughts of a single man. I never thought of it that way. In each example, we find vastly sized creations beginning from nothing more than minute, almost infinitesimal sized points of inception. And all of them grew symmetrically outward from their originating center. With this insight, we found centers to be the key component in two very essential aspects of being, namely symmetry and origins. Does this mean centers are an essential element of being? It appears so. Because trees hold rich significance in Western spirituality and Buddha famously attained his enlightenment meditating under a tree, they likely possess even more clues to nature's underlying character. Because centers are associated with origins, let's examine their role in the life cycle of a tree. Please describe how a tree's life unfolds. Sure. A tree's life begins when a seedling falls to the ground. Upon the convergence of certain conditions, the seed sprouts and grows simultaneously upward and downward. The entire process is guided by the originating seed's genetic code, driving the tree higher to capture ever more resources. Until one day our budding tree produces the seeds of the next generation, drops them to the ground, and initiates the life cycle process anew. Yes and as I understand it, some plants, such as poppy plants, as well as some insects and animals, only live long enough to produce the next generation seedling before they pass. So seedlings are not only a tree's origin, they're also its ultimate aim. These ideas raise some interesting, and what I believe interrelated concepts. For instance, since a tree exists because of its originating seedling, one could say centers, in this case the seedling, are the cause of a tree. Since you raise the concept of causes, I must ask, are there any corresponding effects? Yes. For instance, since a seedling's genetic code directs all of a tree's subsequent growth, one could say the effects resulting from a seedling is the tree itself. In other words, creations begin from a center and all that follows is perpetuated by that same center. Seedlings and centers as both chicken and egg. Yes. Another insight from these ideas is the role of centers in the concept of destinies. I say this because I believe a tree's main purpose is to produce the next generation seedling. Otherwise there would be no continuity of trees or other life forms, they would die off. Thus a tree's ultimate and indeed final aim is to produce the tree's forthcoming seedling. The seedling, i.e. the tree's center, can therefore be considered the tree's destiny. These insights place centers at the heart of a host of additional, key elements of being, namely causes and effects, 
purposes, origins, and destinations. Because centers are where trees begin and end, centers then, also appear to be deeply associated with, if not the cause of, the universe's steadfast drive to return things to their source. It's the phenomenon causing proteins to return to their originating DNA, salmons to journey thousands of miles to their spawning grounds, and stars to collapse back to the same gravitational center where they began. Do these concepts apply to our lives as well? Yes. Rituals unfold toward an originating purpose while conflicts only achieve resolution when the instigating dispute is confronted and resolved. Those are some wonderful insights. They speak volumes about how our lives fit into the universe's grand jigsaw puzzle of being. Before we go any further, we need to back up for a moment and address an issue we've so far glossed over. We've spoken much about centers and the larger creations they ultimately produce. But we haven't yet addressed how centers actually accomplish this. What I mean to say is, we need to consider how centers go about their Samson and Goliath-like feat of controlling and converting their extended surroundings into the creations unfolding about them. I see your point. Centers appear to possess an invisible, almost magical, ability to perform work beyond their surface. It's significant that you mention invisible forces. The first thing that comes to my mind is the concept of fields which are, in fact, capable of what you just mentioned, that is, they can transmit effects far beyond their source location. As I understand it they underlie all of nature's basic forces. In physics, they are known as force fields. They might be the missing link between centers and the larger creations they produce. If I remember correctly from college, fields underlay many phenomena. For instance, the Earth's magnetic field causes magnets to point north. An electric field induces positively charged electrons to move toward the negative pole of a car battery. Gravity's field pulls each of us to the center of the Earth. So, fields act as a kind of agent, similar to how the police enforce the laws that originated at the core of our legal institutions. Yes but I'd rather like to think of fields as little holy spirits performing the work of a great creator. Please tell me more about these fields. Fields have a phenomenal ability to distort the very fabric of the time-space continuum about them into an ever-collapsing, well-like shape. The well's form isn't tubular like a town's wishing well but instead, shaped like a bowling ball sitting on a trampoline. In essence, the walls of the well become increasingly steeper as you move toward the bowling ball, i.e. the center at the bottom of the well. It's the inward collapsing geometry of a field, i.e. a kind of falling down ness, that imparts a force on objects. In fact, the forces acting on objects result from the shape of the field, hence the term force field. So fields serve to align a lot things to a common center, like compasses pointing north. They can even cause things to fall inward like a skydiver free falling toward the earth. Thank God for parachutes. Through this understanding of fields, I'm starting to see the physical link between centers and the larger holes they organize about them. In fact, I can see how centers stir and mold their surroundings into larger, cohesive creations. Please tell me more about the overall shape of these wells. The bowling ball on a trampoline analogy I just alluded to is good for visualizing the shape of fields but it's limiting as well. A field's overall shape actually resembles a halo-like sphere. So what you're saying is center-slash-field configurations naturally produce symmetric, aesthetically pleasing geometries. I believe we're closing in on something significant. Tell me, why is the field symmetric? Why isn't it uneven? I suppose this is due to the center being even and smooth, possibly even homogeneous. That implies there's a certain purity about centers. Yes. An evenly formed and pure center would radiate its evenness, and purity, to its surroundings via a symmetrical and uninterrupted field. That implies there's a certain purity about centers. Yes. An evenly formed and pure center would radiate its evenness, and purity, to its surroundings via a symmetrical and uninterrupted field. If that doesn't hint of divine intervention, I don't know what does. Think about it. If you wanted to develop a perfect design you'd place purity at its core. 
such purity would help everything that follows get off to the best possible start. In addition, the fields surrounding them would become perfectly rounded like halos in holy paintings and the geometric perfection of circles and spheres. I also have to wonder, does this purity at centers somehow tie into our earlier discussions? Do nature's creations begin in small places such that they might have a better chance of being pure? It makes sense. If you wanted to produce something exceedingly pure, you'd make it as small as possible. In other words, the smaller something is, the less likely it would possess impurities. Such advantageous initial conditions would also help all that follows, i.e. the creation, to be symmetrically arranged. If I hear you correctly, you're saying creations with pure beginnings i.e. pure centers, will evolve into more balanced and symmetrically formed creations. Yes. Another quality of center-oriented designs we must consider are the stabilizing effects they naturally generate. By causing objects to be drawn inward, fields encourage things to gather and stay together. In many ways, center bias designs provide the organizational compactness nature's creations need to be stable and endure. It's no wonder nature's primary forms are center-oriented circles, spheres, radials, clusters, and branching systems since these shapes provide the firm foundation from which the universe's steadfast creations of atoms, cells, solar systems, galaxies, societies, etc. can survive and, indeed, thrive, as they do. Another great insight. We've covered a lot of ground today. Let's pause and summarize what we just ran through. Okay. I'll try. Centers mark the location from which larger creations begin. Centers are often small, even and pure. Centers emit invisible fields which shape the surrounding space into a symmetric, halo-like well about the originating center. Fields create larger, holistic creations about the originating center by causing objects in their surroundings to gather and coalesce about them. In essence, the created thing mimics the shape of the field underlying it. It may not be obvious but what you just said, in fact, outlines a process of creation. It succinctly describes how hosts of unassociated things might be transformed into cohesive organizations through the dynamics generated by a central object. Could you give me some real-life examples? Sure. Electrons gather about a central nucleus to form atoms. Molecules come together in increasingly robust combinations around an electrical charge concentrated between them. Cells undertake myriad processes orchestrated by the cell's core DNA. All the tributaries of a river flow towards a central mouth. Naturally, planets rotate about stars, herds organize about alpha males, and bees converge around their unique queen. I suppose it's not a stretch to assume that this same dynamic applies to human affairs. For instance, a core purpose provides the anchor from which larger rituals can unfold. Further, I believe meanings serve to unite hosts of variables into a single theme, for example, the moral of the story summarizes whole books while symbols provide the glue to unite nations of people. I can't help but notice the thought I'm thinking right now serves to unify, and therefore center numerous subordinate thoughts. I suppose human-generated fields aren't raw fields like electricity, magnetism, and gravitation but are, instead, sensory fields such as sight, sound, and information. That makes good sense. Fields of sight and sound organize groups of people around street performers, movies, and circus acts. Information distributed in newspapers and textbooks aligns our societies with common ideas and beliefs as much as a sun's gravitational field aligns a host of planets. It's said that queen ants use powerful scent fields to help control worker ants. I suppose the smell of food and perfume attract us as well. Our discussion has progressed quite far today. Yes. Many of the uncertainties haunting me this morning have all but vanished. Taking all points into account, I venture to say that the universe possesses a great creative force rooted in centers. A phenomenal penchant to spontaneously form point-like centers empowered with invisible yet far-reaching force fields. Their combined effects not only raising order from chaos, but also adorning the universe with the stunning qualities of holism, stability, beauty, balance, and harmony. Centers quite literally as the driving force behind nature's stunning mosaic of being. Alas, 
there's still something that remains unresolved. From some of the phenomena you mentioned earlier, it appeared that fields are, for the lack of a better term, somewhat choosy in what they interact with. For instance, when a compass's needle points north, it does so only because it is magnetized. In other words, if the needle weren't magnetized, it wouldn't point north. What you're saying is the source, in this case the North Pole, and the thing it affects, the magnetized pointer, must share something in common in order for them to interact. That seems to be the case. Isn't this like seeks like quality of fields also what draws birds of a feather to flock together and groups to gather in clubs around common interests? It's as though fields possess a vibration like quality and only communicate with things sharing the same vibration. It's like having a group of tuning forks. If you strike one, those sharing the same frequency or multiple of that frequency will begin to vibrate, in other words, only those sharing the same frequency as the source will be affected. Yes. In the case of fields, only those things sharing the same frequency or vibration as the field will be affected. Likewise, since it's the center object producing the field, this means that only those things sharing the same frequency as the center will be affected. Clearly, you know what that implies? It means the larger holistic creation forming about its center will reflect the character and qualities of its source. The created truly reflect their creator. This relates to our earlier discussions in which we found that the quality of purity is often associated with centers. I see. So, a center's purity is transmitted to the larger whole via its purity vibrating fields? Yes. Fields transmit a center's purity to the larger creation forming about it, ensuring it's infused with the greatest of qualities possible as it grows. A further reason to believe a divine force orchestrates the universe's grand order. Indeed. This quality, along with the geometric symmetry generated by centers, appears to have a lot to do with why there's so much beauty and indeed wonderfulness streaming throughout our universe. That's epic. This idea has implications as to what we choose to create as humans as well. It implies that if we want to create something pure and beautiful, we need to start it with similar type qualities, virtue and sincerity for instance. On the other hand, if we choose to start something with impure and improper intentions, we must realize the ultimate outcome will also be impure and distorted. That speaks of ethics and how we should conduct our lives. Interesting. We've just arrived at the lake's far point at the same time that our conversation also seems to have arrived. Yes, now that we've reached the place we set out to achieve, both in our walk and in our discussion, let's take a break and describe what we've discovered today as well as any possible extensions. To me, it seems, through exploring the local, we discovered some global truths. It does. That through journeying to the heart of things we can discover their essence and in fact larger truths. We found that centers are the driving force behind nature's creative process they are the places where things begin, and the conductors directing the symphony of the larger creations forming about them. Moreover, we've found that centers and fields naturally generate a variety of beneficial qualities including symmetry, stability, beauty, balance, holism, collaborativeness, and harmonious relationships. In a more general sense, what you're saying is that whenever we journey to the heart of something, a flower or a tree, a conversation or a relationship, a law or policy, we discover its essence and its reason for being here. Yes. We've also discovered that, in nature, centers use pureness at the start of things to help ensure auspicious outcomes. This is an important concept in human proceedings since all relationships and things emanating from their point of inception are dependent upon the very condition of the originating center. We should strive to ensure that the conditions surrounding the centers we create are as pure and genuine as possible so as to contribute to the overall greatness of ourselves, our creations, and the universe. That's a deeply meaningful concept and one that forms the basis of an entire philosophy on how we should live our lives. We now need to consider this concept's universality, 
And what better way to do so than by traversing the full spectrum of being? Let's journey to the very heart of the universe. After that, we can track back to the here and now of where we are on this lake today. Please allow me to take this one. You're a brave lad. Please, it's yours. Okay. Let's see. Speaking of the universal, since all things gather about domineering centers and these centers produce remarkable, near-perfect creations, doesn't that also mean, by extension, that there's an all-perfect super-being at the heart of the universe radiating love and purity throughout our wonderfully arranged, near-perfect cosmos? If so, then each creation is a microcosm of the entire universe. A pure heart in the bosom of all things lovingly crafting the larger creation about it into a perfect reflection of itself. That might be the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. The heart and soul of the Creator radiating through the core of all beings creating a perfect kind of harmony between heaven and earth. I must say, that's the most lucid description I've run across describing the mechanics necessary to sustain the colossal handiwork we see streaming throughout the universe. It's also a compelling statement supporting the Creator's existence. I agree. Our discussion today has tipped the scale further in favor of belief. Interestingly, the idea of a powerful entity at the heart of the universe finds a comfortable home in both science and religion. In science, it's the idea of the Big Bang. Physicists describe the universe's inception as, and get this, the moment when the entire contents of our universe were mashed into an exceedingly small point in space and time. This, of course, further corroborates our earlier discussions discovering that the beginning points of nature's creations are often very small and exceedingly significant. It's no wonder cosmologists call the moment of the Big Bang, the Grand Unification. In many ways, the mother of all centers. That's an enormous idea, both figuratively and literally. Yes and, whereas science and religion don't agree on much, they surprisingly overlap in how the universe was created. Yes, many religions describe the universe's moment of creation as the sudden transformation of nothingness into the somethingness of order and light. Both science and religion describe the universe as starting from a state of extreme smallness that transformed into something much larger, the universe. Now that we've been to the far end of the universe, let us return to the space we now occupy. Let us take a path inward, journey to the here and now of our being, and say something about the little universes we create as humans. I'm truly fascinated by how related and deeply intertwined they are. Okay. Since we've determined that the universe's design of choice naturally gives rise to harmonious relationships, it seems logical that if we wanted more of the same in our lives, we should follow nature's lead as outlined by her template of creation. Yes, and since all things reflect the very character of their point of inception, we should strive to make the centers of our lives as pure and wholesome as possible. Doing so, the larger relationships of our lives will also be evenly arranged, well-formed, balanced, and wholesome. When you say we should purify the center points of our lives, I take it to mean we should strive to be as compassionate, genuine, loving, kind, and caring as possible. Yes. It's no surprise these qualities are recognized as virtues. Let's pursue this idea further and consider what the important centers of our lives are. Okay. The centers of our lives must be similar to centers in nature. In other words, they should be places where things begin and are organized about. Good observation. The beginning points of our lives are where things start and take hold. These are our thoughts, words, and interactions. They are where the larger patterns of relationships, families, and societies start from, arise, and grow. They're also what our epitaphs are constructed from. It must be so. What else, except our minds could produce the points of inception of our lives? Thoughts amplified into words and actions are truly the places where our lives begin. One sees quickly why mindfulness is so important. That's an essential point. Yes. The character of our thoughts and words are largely shaped by our general disposition. Mindfulness practice of cultivating a strong and well-balanced, 
Base mental condition helps ensure life's various points of inception get off to their best possible start. Well put. All great things emerge from solid bedrocks. It makes sense to carry this philosophy through to all the various centers of our lives. For instance, I once read how various ancient centers of mind regulate not only blood pressure and breathing, but also drive us toward securing essential needs such as food, shelter, procreation, and well-being. I've read similar things. I suppose there are also centers of mind related to wants, desires, and dreams. Sure. That makes sense. After filling our stomachs and completing our work, we spend the remainder of our days undertaking activities to secure objects of our desire. This is what drives us to dream of vacation homes, to want a new gadget, and to become a superstar. So in fact, much of our lives are organized about centers of needs, wants, and desires. It appears that way. Ah, I know what you're going to say next. You know me too well. Borrowing from nature's intelligence we do ourselves great favors ensuring the centers of our life are as pure as possible. For instance, our air and water should be clean and unpolluted. Our food should be organic and freshly prepared instead of being frozen, canned, and laden with preservatives. I suppose our homes should also be clean, warm and inviting? Yes. We should also place the greatest values, love, trust, understanding, and wisdom, at the core of our relationships and, especially, at the center of the greatest creation of our lifetime, our families. We should use the same approach when contemplating our hopes, wants, dreams, and desires, correct? Yes, and that reminds me, we should be careful what we wish for because it could quite easily become a reality someday. We should reach for the stars and strive to achieve true greatness, however, what we wish for should be rooted in something beautiful and right, so when it blossoms, we'll have a fair degree of confidence that what we created will be something good and possibly great. So the first step in dream playing should be asking ourselves, is what I want charmed with goodness and rightness? If the answer is yes, then the goal, want, or desire is probably worth pursuing. A simple yet potent guideline. Along these lines, it also makes sense to consider our relationship with the various sources of our lives, the things that nourish and sustain us. You must be referring to nature and this lovely planet we inhabit. Yes. Nature is truly the source of which all of our lives depend. She provides all our basic needs, air, water, and food, as well as the fuel and raw materials that power society. We should treat nature with the utmost respect and reverence she deserves. Many would say that isn't the case, that we don't respect nature and that we're abusing our planet. That's sadly true. By trashing these essential cores, we're living out of balance and creating worlds of destruction and deformity. I suspect we are violating even deeper, more fundamental laws. It's like slapping our forefathers in the face and trampling on them. It's a sad indictment of our times but also hints at a path forward. Yes. It's tragic yet hopeful at the same time. There's a wonderful lesson for society here. If we put Mother Nature back at the core of our lives, both functionally and spiritually, we have a real chance at turning around the terrible funk our society finds itself in today. One can argue with that. Who doesn't want to live a more meaningful lifestyle and leave something beautiful behind for future generations? How true. Today, so many say they do it for the kids. But, in fact, our actions don't hold up to scrutiny when we consider how much our society consumes versus how little it gives back. It's amazing just how cavalier we can be. People will rip living trees out of the ground because they're in the way without a second thought to the significance of trees towards our subsistence. Does anyone place a cost on what they use and consume? The electricity in our homes, the fuel in our cars, and all the packaging that fill our dumpsters? That's a clear indication that society no longer holds nature in any regard much less extends a basic consideration for her. We only view nature as the means to our ends when it is, in fact, the means, the beginning, 
the end, and all the stages in between. Of course, many would say such talk puts trees and the planet ahead of people. Not true. Modern society's agendas are not only harming the planet, they're also toxic to our souls and well-being. Please explain further. Look around. By most measures, our consumer-based society isn't happy. The symptoms include physical and emotional distress, irritability, fear, recklessness, callousness, and a lack of trust and meaning. These symptoms define our time. It's unfortunate but true. We're a society of overworked, overweight, overcompeting, overdrugged, and overconsuming souls. The excesses of today's extreme quantity of living approach are not giving people what they need to thrive or feel well. It's quite ironic, our advanced society is not giving people what they need or want. How do you propose we turn it around? Societies are organized the same as all of nature's other creations, the way of the whole organism goes the way of its core. Thus, society is sick because impure intentions and designs lay at its nucleus. A greedy, nepotistic, power-hungry, and short-sighted power base legislates more of the same. The way of society goes the way of its center. You hit it on the head, to effect real, positive, and lasting change, we must heal this core, essentially redefine what society holds dear by rewriting its mission statement. Yes. In order to heal the whole of a society, we need only treat its core values. We need to supplant the current quantity-based, nothing's ever enough beliefs with quality-based, rational, and sensible ones of balance, wisdom, and understanding. Real and right values in turn radiating real and right messages, broadcasts, and laws into our homes, streets, schools, institutions, and hearts. Sounds like a utopian dream. A tad, possibly, but over time and a few generations it becomes easy to imagine and in fact manageable. A practical way forward appears within reach. If we adopt bold, long-term approaches, we've a realistic chance of implementing powerful and positive change. Imagine man, society, nature, and the universe aligned and working in harmony toward something great. That all sounds good. But what are the specifics of implementing such a grand scheme? I'm glad you asked. We must renew and restructure our laws and taxes and what we teach our children, all being designed to guide us toward better, more balanced, rightful, and sustainable goals. Slowly at first, followed by progressive implementation over the course of one to two decades, real change is possible. In this way, we have a shot at rebalancing the needs of the human soul and the planet sustaining us. That is a practical framework from which to proceed. It also highlights just how empty today's slogans are. In fact, all the hollow promises are only making the situation worse. They lead people to believe they are making a difference when, in fact, they only make people feel good while society, and we along with it, continue to trample nature. I agree. The belief that we're making any meaningful change is a farce and the greatest illusion of our time. There's a larger message here. Go on. I believe we have a larger obligation to live our lives in balanced ways because the universe's creative force is a process which naturally produces greater, symmetrical, more beautiful and collaborative things. This applies to all interrelationships including us. The universe's natural disposition is to promote a certain rightness and goodness. When we go against the natural good and its higher callings, we are in many ways violating laws over, above, and encompassing mankind. A marvelous insight and a challenge for us to strive to always do our best. All this hints of a divine test. I believe we have a choice. Whereas nature spontaneously produces purity in all her points of inception, our advanced cognitive skills grant us the unique ability to sway the very character of our lives' starting points and, thereby, the very content of the larger things we create. So, are you saying the Creator gave us a large say in shaping the outcome of the things we create, including our lives? Yes. Like a divine gift. 
we've been granted the ability to choose between purity and creativity, on one hand, and impurity and destructiveness on the other, as well as all the many shades in between. And, because society's core is so corrupt these days, it seems that most of us are taking the easy way out, downward and toward the less than savory. That's not a mindful choice. That's just being whisked away by the stream. How sadly true. It's as though the universal soul is here with us, ready and willing to assist us in building a life of purity, goodness, and harmony. We just need to let it back into our hearts and allow it to guide us towards a more meaningful life. Beautiful. I believe we've said all that can be said. I agree. Today has been filled with talk of the greatest things, beauty, rightness, divinity, and hope. I, too, like where we've traversed today. We've outlined real and positive means to live our lives through simply aligning them to nature's ways. I also like how we were able to link the great creator and nature to our personal lives, bringing to light a path transcending mankind. And, today, we found real and practical solutions to guide society. We revealed a simple and straightforward set of principles to resolve the many dilemmas haunting mankind, a centering path, if you will, to help us reach our new goals. A definitive direction to guide us going forward both as individuals and nations. A path for those seeking a better way. One that begins and ends at the heart of the universe. My good friend, this has been a great day. I, too, will always hold dear this conversation and look forward with great anticipation to our next. Let us head home and celebrate our auspicious day and the great promise of a better tomorrow. The End Check out more of Jin's books at www.jinyueblog.com.